Algonquin wolves were once across the temperate eastern forests of North America, so probably southern Ontario, possibly part of the Maritimes, all the way down into Florida, Louisiana. And then Europeans came and colonized North America, and when they arrived, they not only cleared land and turned great wolf habitat into poor wolf habitat, but they also persecuted all large carnivores mercilessly. The wolves that remained ended up being pushed a little bit further north into the Algonquin Park area. People could tell that they were different, and that's why they were classified at the time as a subspecies of the gray wolf, because they were noticeably different. They seemed to act differently at the time they were predominantly eating deer. Algonquin wolves are larger than a coyote and smaller than a gray wolf. They tend to be a tawny brown color, reddish tones behind the ears and on the outside of the legs. One universal feature of wolves and coyotes and, and Algonquin wolves is that almost without fail, they're smaller than you think. It takes a whole family to raise a litter of pups, that's for sure. Uh, whether that's just like two cooperating parents or if they've got um, some offspring from the previous years, I mean, a pack of puppies, that's like a, a lot of chaos to control and to teach uh, so that they hone their skills and can learn to be wolves and, and hunt properly and avoid danger and interact with other wolves or not, depending as the case may be. It's sort of like a community for them within their family pack, and that's very important for them. Um, and if they, if they don't have that, they really, I mean, the wolf is as strong as the pack. That's sort of like one of those uh, adages, and you really need all those different members sort of interacting with each other. When they think about wolves and wolf social organization, you, you, we often hear about alpha wolves, you know, and, the, and, and really an alpha wolf is just a, a breeding animal. So a wolf pack is, is just a family, and um, you've got an unrelated breeding pair, and those are what we would have formerly called the alphas, and then you've got uh, pups, you know, and sometimes wolves don't mature until they're a couple years old, so, so a pack of wolves might include pups from several previous litters, and those pups are of you know, various sizes, the older ones being larger, and they tend to sort of sort out that way. They're very, very playful and very expressive, um, they have really usually pretty strong and long courting experience, you know. Um, they typically mate for life or for a long time. Um, so it's like a really well-knit kind of family until the, the kids basically fledge. The pups eventually disperse usually. The wolves are very important to the ecosystem's whole integrity. It's not just like they're a standalone unit that we should, you know, we should focus on them because there are a few of them. It's not just about that. It's about we need top predators on the landscape to do their job as top predators and the rest of the landscape benefits. Public Wolf House began in Algonquin Park on Highway 60. I think it was 1963 was the first year they tried one. And that was because the wolf researchers out of the day were using human howls to get responses from wolves. And the, the park interpretive staff thought it would be a great idea to have people actually hear wolves because it is such an important part of, uh, of an experience in the wild to hear wolves howl. And for many people, especially back you know, 50 years ago, um, there was a lot of misunderstanding about wolves and, and apprehension about wolves. And this was a way of educating people about what wolves are really like. Last year, when you and I came here, four or five wolves answered back, and then behind us, a wolf answered back. And I looked back to where the one that held behind us, and out came a wolf pup onto the road, ran down, and went around the side of the pond to join the, the other rest of the pack there. Well, now let's go to a spot where I've had wolves answer back many times in the last few years. So, fingers crossed. City. Is that where all the wolves are? That's like the wolf metropolis. Hey guys, do you think we're actually going to see any wolves out here or what? Uh, I don't know. It's their choice if they want to come. It is their choice. It's sneaky like a mouse. Wow. You guys are pretty good howlers. Alright, we're going to practice. We're going to practice. I need to howl. I think the idea that wolves are kind of that, that big bad wolf and that narrative that exists, that's something that has been passed on generation to generation. I don't know where it comes from exactly, perhaps from farmers and settlers who are trying to protect livestock or you know whatever it might be, but 
you see that now even when we've moved away from having farms or these massive settlements where we have animals, it's an us versus them. It's never a relationship side by side. If you're able to actually spend time with these animals, you know that they're not threatening to you in any way, but rather they're going about their daily lives just as we are. They say that the dog is descended from a wolf. And I guess that's true because we saw up there riding around, we could see all these crazy little marks in the, on the pond. We got over there and it, it was wolves. It was wolves. They were playing just like your, like your dogs do. Like, well, how do you play? They were just chasing each other around on that pond. And I couldn't believe how far that wolf could jump. So I'm from the community of the Chippewas of Rama, so my father's indigenous, and growing up, he has such a strong love for wolves. Now I've been able to land this incredible opportunity to research my favorite animal on indigenous land and incorporating my culture into it. A really cool approach to science is two-eyed seeing, so that's basically looking at it through two lens. One eye is looking at Western science, which is, you know, the traditional approach, and the other one is Indigenous knowledges. The two I seeing incorporating the indigenous knowledges concept of it is talking to community members as they're the ones who have lived on the land, they understand the land, they know the land. So that can create a foundation for the Western sciences. People talk about wolves and humans co-evolving together. We sort of assumed that we domesticated wolves and made them into dogs, but there's some work that says, well, maybe they actually domesticated us. We sort of figured out this symbiotic relationship whereby we gave them food and, and they gave us protection and hunting skills. The distance is, is what builds the connection. If we had a wolf sitting here at my feet, it wouldn't feel so important to do all the work to come to know it in, in its own way. The fact that we have to try to come to know it on its own terms, and yet we are inevitably going to fail at that endeavor, but we keep trying again and again, is what I think love looks like, right? That's how we build relationships with one another. What the best part to me about the public wolf howl is that you can sense the excitement of people because hundreds, hundreds of people, if not like a thousand or two thousand at a time, are perfectly quiet, like lined up with their cars along a highway. That's how excited people are for the chance of hearing a howl. This spot is so typical of where wolves are in August in Algonquin Park. They've got open water, that forest cover around, and there are spots by the edges where it's open but not really wet. I guess we'll give it a shot now, shall we? Every time I hear wolves, I still get that incredible rush, that feeling of exhilaration, of contact with, with the wild. That's hard, you can't describe it properly. It's, you have to experience it. Okay, guys, come here, come here. So we're gonna do some howling for wolves, okay? They start light, and go high, and then come back down. Three. Two, one. Ah! They sort of show us in real time what resilience can look like, what environmental resilience can look like. And we have spent our life, or generations, settlers have, trying to eliminate wolves in this country, and we have not been successful. And there's, you know, only pockets that remain now, but they still remain. At that time, wolves were heavily dependent on deer as, as a primary food source, and so the Thibergers and their grad students in the late 80s began to document 
entire wolf packs leaving the park in the wintertime and going to feed on deer in these areas. And the catch with that was that although these wolves were protected in the park, when they left the park and went to, to feed on deer in areas outside the park, they were no longer legally protected. And many of the radio collared wolves, and in fact, in some cases, entire packs of wolves were being killed you know, by hunters and trappers in these wintering areas outside the park. So it didn't take very long, like in terms of evolutionary time, 250 years is a heartbeat, not even a heartbeat. And now we have a, what's ostensibly a different population of wolves on the precipice of extinction. And we have our slightly larger and uh, pretty stable at the moment Algonquin wolf population left in Ontario. Um, and so we owe it to the wolves, I think, in Ontario where we still can recover them. Among many First Nations, you know, wolves, rather than being viewed as, as sort of vermin or competition, they are held with a certain degree of reverence and, and even considered a brother. When you put it into perspective, it's a privilege for us to be part of that, you know, whereas it's not optional for wolves. They, they, they live out there and, and they need first access to, to all our natural resources. Somehow we're connected and everything is connected. And I think we're connected to, to all those animals. Because we use them as our totems, right? So we don't just use anything for a totem. We use specific animals. Success with the Algonquin wolf looks like no legal killing of them so that they have the time to recover. Um, they have the time to re-establish in areas where wolves haven't been for a considerable amount of time. The main question that we have to ask ourselves as people is, how different are we really, considering we are also super predators and they're just sort of regular, you know, evolved top predators? And what does that mean about the way we treat them? And would we treat other species that are like us the same way? You've got to sort of step back and look at the ways that we are similar and treat them the way you would treat any other family, knowing that they're important and they've got you know, a whole background to them, a whole culture to them. Uh, and we are sort of getting in the way of letting them do their job on the landscape. There's some folks who think, oh, well, if we could just restory the wolf to, to have these good symbolic associations with it, then that would be better. And I think that misses the point, which is we should be trying to know the wolf as it is, right? The Algonquin wolf as a specific population. And if we only ever make them a symbol, then we're, it's easier to love them, but it's also easier to kill them. We need to interact with them as they are, not symbols, living and breathing creatures. The story of the Algonquin wolf shows us that nothing is inevitable, that nature will often find a way in the face of all kinds of adversity to thrive, right? And so, you know, the population is stable, right? And people are coming to meet the wolf on their own terms. And that's an exciting development. If we can take that story and apply it to the rest of nature, we'd be in a really good place. So being hopeful about the future is, I think, what the Algonquin wolf sort of, at least for me, inspires me to be. It's great they don't howl every time. If it was that easy, it would become less interesting, less powerful. And then when they do answer back, it's such a powerful response and internally. You know, eventually, somewhere, at some point, there'll be wolves answering back to you. <laughs>